In investigating the cell at the intermediate level, we will be building upon the concepts that we previously discussed at the primary level. And I hope each of you have had the opportunity to review that material. At the primary level, we investigated cells on a very cursory basis. We saw the difference between plant and animal cells. And on the primary tape, I talked about using this piece of equipment, the microprojector. It's very versatile and very useful. And one of these can be shared amongst all the teachers in your school. If you have an older model, you'll find that these newer ones are much more advanced with higher power light sources and better lenses, condenser lenses, to produce much more light. If you're unfamiliar with operating this piece of equipment, you should refer to the K3 tape because we cover the operation of this Kenavision microprojector in great detail. At the primary level, we looked at two different types of cells, the plant cell and the animal cell. The plant cell we looked at was the onion skin cell, and we used iodine to stain the onion skin. And we also talked about preparing what's called a wet mount slide. This is when we dropped the drop of iodine on the onion skin and laid the cover slip over it. The students were not only able to see the hard cell wall, but also the nucleus that was stained by the iodine. The second type of cell we looked at was the animal cell. And here we used the human cheek cells. We prepared a slide with human cheek cells and stained it with iodine. The animal cells don't have a hard cell wall, but you can see the nucleus with the iodine. Now it's time to go back and take another look at both of these types of cells with your students and have them get more into the particular parts of the cell. In the plant cell, we have five major parts. We have the hard outer cell wall, then just inside of that, we have a cell membrane. The nucleus, of course, is in the inside of the cell, and it's surrounded by this liquid material called cytoplasm. Also in a plant cell, we find little green bodies called chloroplasts. These are like little chemical factories that produce food from sunlight using chlorophyll. The animal cell has only three main parts. It has no hard outer cell wall, but it does have the cell membrane. Inside the cell membrane, the liquid is also called cytoplasm. And then, of course, we have the nucleus. Also at the primary level, we investigated some single-celled organisms. And for efficiency, I suggested that the primary teacher share the samples with the intermediate teacher. And the students can see the same types of microorganisms on two separate occasions. At the intermediate level, we'll go into more depth, and in particular, look at how these microorganisms move. There's three different means of locomotion. The amoeba has a false foot, and it moves its foot outward and then brings its body along into its foot. The amoeba has no mouth, and when it feeds, it surrounds the victim and absorbs it directly through the cell membrane. It carries the material as a food vacuole inside the cytoplasm. The amoeba also has other vacuoles or areas of waste material and water that it expels. The amoeba reproduces very simply by first duplicating the chromosomes inside the nucleus, then the nucleus splits in two to form two nuclei. These two nuclei migrate to either end of the cell and then the cell splits, and we now have two. Many other protozoans move about with hundreds of short hair-like cilia. These cilia move in a beautiful rhythm and send this paramecium gliding and spinning through the water. Like the amoeba, the paramecium has no head or arms or legs, but it does have a mouth right in the middle of its body. It also uses the cilia to push food into its mouth. The paramecium has two nuclei, a big one and a small one. It also has food bubbles and waste bubbles like the amoeba. Another ciliate worth observing is the stentor. The stentor will either be trumpet shaped or it'll sometimes resemble a ball when disturbed. It uses the cilia on the widest end to move about and gather food. Sometimes it anchors itself to a solid object on the other end. One of the largest ciliates is the sporostomum. 
Compared to the previous two, it's difficult to see inside this protozoan's body. The third and final type of locomotion that we'll study is that produced by a whip-like flagellum. The long lashing tail on these euglenas help them to move about and gather food. The euglena is an excellent example of a true protist. It moves about like an animal, but has chloroplasts like a plant and can make its own food. It also moves by contracting down to a plump pear shape and then back again. The euglena also has a red eye spot, which enables it to sense light. Euglenas are attracted to light, but if they're kept in the dark, they'll lose their chlorophyll and will absorb food that's dissolved in the water. The volvox is another interesting flagellate. It's really a colony of cells grouped together. Each cell has a firm cell wall and chloroplasts like a plant and two flagella. As they lash back and forth, the whole ball turns slowly in the water. Daughter colonies develop within the parent, and finally the parent ball bursts open, releasing the daughter colonies to continue on their own. Now that you and your students are familiar with different types of microorganisms, it's time to go on a hunt in a drop of local pond water. Bring in a sample of pond water, and before you start searching through it madly looking for things, let's put some ingredients in it and help these little microorganisms to thrive. Here's my secret recipe. First, get some hay, about a medium-sized handful. Timothy hay works best. Drop that in the pond water, and then cover it with a piece of cheesecloth and a rubber band, and let it sit in a fairly warm, not too bright, place for about three days. You don't want it in direct sunlight. After the three days have passed, remove the cheesecloth, add about five grains of rice. This is uncooked rice. Drop that in. Add a small piece of boiled lettuce. Boil the lettuce for a few minutes. Small piece, throw that in there. And my secret ingredient is a pinch of non-fat dry milk. Drop that in. Cover it again. Put the rubber band on, let it sit in the same spot for three more days, and you should have a very productive little ecosystem in here with lots of microorganisms. Now you want to test different levels, so you should have little pipettes, little glass tubes that narrow down. If you want to test material from the top part, just lower the tip of the pipette under the surface. Then put your thumb over the end of it and draw it out. You now have a surface sample. If you want to take a sample from the bottom, lower the pipette to the very bottom and then put your thumb over it and draw it out. The very first drop that comes out of the pipette will be a bottom sample. If you don't see anything on your first sample, don't give up. There's probably lots of little living things in your pond water. Another very interesting technique is called a hay infusion. And this is when we transfer a microorganism from one place to another. To do this, we need a medium in which the microorganism can live, and it's going to be different than what we made here. This time, you take a liter of water and boil it. As soon as it begins to boil, throw in a handful of hay. Timothy hay once again works well. Boil that for 10 minutes. After the 10 minutes, remove it from the fire and let it sit and cool down. Let it sit for two days. Then you're ready to inoculate it. Now let's say you want to put a paramecium in there. Well, first you have to have a paramecium, know that you have one to put it in there. And these little tubes come in handy again. We'll go back to our micro projector. We'll put some paramecium on a slide, and then I'll show you how we'll grab the paramecium off the slide with this tube and put it in our new hay infusion material. All right, on this slide, I have a drop of water that has paramecium in it. I know that because I can see them. The next thing I want to do is try and capture one with my tiny little capillary tube. When the capillary tube touches the slide, the little drop, some of the water will immediately suck up inside. And maybe I can get a paramecium. There, one we saw him go in right there. Now, to make sure I've got this paramecium, I'll hold the capillary tube itself under the micro projector and focus it and see if the paramecium is there. You can see the paramecium swimming around inside the little tube. 
right at the very end right now. I can also look around to see if I have any others. There's another one up there. And there's another one. I have three. There's one at the top. So it looks like I have about four paramecium in this little tube. Now all that's required is to transfer these little critters into their new environment. To do that, simply hold it near the liquid and blow on the end. If you're working with paramecium, you might want to add the secret ingredient, a pinch of non-fat dry milk. Now some people are saying, well, how am I going to make these little tubes? Well, they're easy to make. We're going to talk about that next. As you get more involved in looking at tiny little things with your microscope or micro projector, you may wish to order some prepared slides. There's a variety of slides available from science supply houses that can help you explain things in your course. If you wish to make your own slides, there's some techniques you should follow and some tools that you might like to use. One of them is making a long, narrow tube out of a piece of glass tubing. The first thing you do, as we did in the physical science tape, is cut the tubing with a triangular file by making just a score mark along one side, holding the score mark away from you, and snapping it. Then we're going to want to heat this up and pull it apart so that it narrows down like an eyedropper would. This is a very fairly easy thing to do and it's something that you shouldn't be afraid to try. And of course, don't forget your safety goggles. By holding the tube in the fire like this, heating it up in the middle, eventually the glass will melt and turning the tube carefully around so that it heats evenly, even moving it back and forth, start to feel fairly pliable here. Then you can just pull carefully on it and pull it out like that. Next, let it cool, get a pair of pliers, and carefully snap the end off, making sure that you snap at just the right point so you make the tube the right length that you want it to be. Now you can either make them very narrow for transferring microorganisms like we've just seen, or you can snap it closer to the base and make the hole larger and you can use it even for transferring cement when you're making permanent slides. This is what we'll take a look at next. When your students make their first permanent slides, you should show them how to properly fix the material before they mount it. When we fix something, we're replacing the water in the cells with alcohol. This preserves the specimen. To properly fix some living material, you'd want to first put it in a container that's three parts water to one part alcohol. After 10 minutes, you remove it and put it in the second container that's half and half. Two parts water, two parts alcohol. 10 more minutes later, we'll move it to the third container that's three parts alcohol now and only one part water. And then finally, the last container after 10 more minutes will be pure alcohol. By transferring it in this way, you will be gradually replacing the water in the cell with pure alcohol. Once your specimen is fixed, you're ready to mount it. Find a small part of it first. I'm going to use this spider leg. First we'll put it on a clean slide. Then we'll add a drop or two of slide cement. You can get this from a science supply house. Rather than use your eyedropper, here's where your little glass tube comes in handy. We'll stick it into the cement, put our finger over the top, and transport the drop to the slide. Once you've put the cement on, you're ready to put the cover slip on, just as we do in a wet mount slide. If you're working with a specimen that's fairly thick, you might first want to put some of these paper reinforcements down. Here I put two or three down before I put this B leg inside, then I added the cement, and then put the cover slip over the top. After about a day, the cement hardens and you have a permanent slide. Don't forget to put a label on the slide and identify what it is. 
The movement of water and nutrients into and out of the cell is a process called osmosis. And it's very important because it explains how cells get the important nutrients they need to grow and how they get rid of wastes. We can demonstrate osmosis with a series of simple activities. First, we'll take a look at a very old egg. This one's been out of the refrigerator for about three weeks. What will happen when I put this egg in water? Well, unlike a fresh egg, the very old egg floats in water. How can we explain this? What has happened to this egg to make it float in water? Well, a student in your class might propose a solution. Some of the material in the egg has actually left it. It's passed right through the membrane in the shell and right through the shell itself. And there's now more air in that egg. Osmosis can be explained in other ways, too. In this example, we're going to take a slice of potato, a very small wedge of it, and we're going to take a look at it under the micro projector. We're going to look at the thinnest end of the wedge so we can see the individual potato cells. Remember that plant cells have a hard outer cell wall. This is made of cellulose and it gives the plant a hard structure. An animal cell doesn't have this cell wall and tends to have a softer body. What would happen to this potato if the water was drawn out of these potato cells? Well, let's try this in our next activity. In this experiment, we're going to investigate how the concentration of salt affects osmosis in a plant cell. To do this, your students can make up the following solutions. Solution number one will be our control. This is pure water. Solution number two will be a 1% salt solution. To make a 1% solution, you weigh out one gram of salt and mix it with 99 milliliters of water. Solution number three will be a 5% salt solution, and this is made by weighing out five grams of salt and mixing it with 95 milliliters of water. Now what we want to find out is how the concentration of salt water surrounding a cell, how that affects the water content in the cell. Now to do this, we're going to add samples of potato. Each piece of potato is sliced about a half a centimeter thick. We'll drop each one in our solutions and we'll let them sit for about 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, we'll remove the potato slices and see if they're spongier or not. If they're spongier, it means that the water in the cell has been drawn out and the cell has lost some of its structure. In the meantime, while we're doing this, we'll try another activity. This time, we have a beaker of water and I poured some iodine into it. And I also have a plastic bag with some starch water in it. This is all sealed off at the top. Now remember that iodine is an indicator for starch. In this test tube, I have a mixture of corn starch and water. When we add some iodine to it, we'll see that the iodine changes from its red color to a purpley black. This indicates the presence of starch. Let's propose this as a question. We will suspend this mixture of corn starch and water in the bag in a beaker with iodine and water in it. What do you think will happen? Well, we'll pull it out after a while and take a look. Now let's take a look at those potato slices that we put in the salt water. First, the control. It seems hard and rigid, much like it was when we put it in. The 1% solution potato slice seems quite flexible, and the one in the 5% solution is very flexible. Now there's some questions you can ask your students. Based on these observations, which slice seems to have the most water still in its cell? The one that is the most rigid. And which slice seems to have the least amount of water within the cell? That would be the one that is most flexible. And the student should also be able to relate how the concentration of salt affects the flexibility of the cell how saltier water draws this water that's inside the cell out of it. This also explains why plants become very soft and flexible when they die. They're losing the water inside their cells. It's been two hours since we started this iodine experiment, and now let's take some observations. First, we notice that the starch is 
kind of settled to the bottom, so we need to shake it a little bit to mix it around. And we also notice that there's a purpley dark color. The starches change color, and the iodine has not. What can we conclude from these two observations? Well, this is a question that you pose to your students. Let them talk about it and discuss it and come up with a possible solution. If you need more information to help them reach a solution, you may want to go back to the iodine and the starch, and this time put the starch in the iodine and let the students see that it changes color. Now, why has the iodine not changed color and the starch has? Well, hopefully a student in your class will come up with a possible solution. Solution being that the iodine particles are small enough to pass through this plastic and the starch particles are too large to go the other way. This is a very important concept because it explains how cells get food and get rid of wastes. For example, we need to get nutrients into the cell and they must pass through the cell membrane. But starch particles cannot pass through. Sugar particles can because they're so much smaller. So when we eat sugar, we get instant energy. But when we eat starch, the starch must first be broken down to sugar before the cells can use it. And this starch is broken down by enzymes. In many respects, cells can be compared to tools. A tool is designed to do a specific job, and so are cells. The simple single-celled organisms can do all the necessary functions for that particular living thing to stay alive. When we look at higher level life forms, we see the need for special cells to do particular tasks because the life form is so complex. When these special cells are formed and work together, we have what is called tissue. For example, our blood is considered a tissue. It is made up of two different cells, red cells and white cells. The red cells take oxygen to the rest of the body and remove the wastes. The white cells protect us from germs, and when the blood is all working together, we have this tissue. When tissues work together, we have what is called organs. Our heart is an organ. It is composed of blood tissue, muscular tissue, nervous tissue, and connective tissue. And finally, when we have organs working together, we have an organ system. It could be anything from a respiratory system, a circulatory system, a reproductive system, or even in the case of a plant, a root system. These are three very important words, and your students should understand how the tissues build into the organs and then into the organ system. Now it might be good to review the five characteristics of living things. First, all living things grow. They reproduce. All living things react to stimuli, whether it's a plant turning its leaves toward the sun or a rabbit being chased by a predator. All living things use energy. We know that plants make their own food and animals consume food. And finally, all living things are made of cells. You can get your class involved in a discussion on living and non-living things. You can also make an assignment to have them bring some cells into school the next day. Or if you really want to trick them, you might try this with your micro projector. We're going to take some copper wire, strands of copper wire, and just put a few strands on this microscope slide. We'll put it on the stage at low power, and we'll observe it, and then we'll drop one drop of silver nitrate onto the copper strands. Watch what happens. When I add the drop of silver nitrate, we start to see some interesting things occurring. It appears that something is growing right on the microscope slide. It looks like a plant with leaves just like a plant would have. But in fact, these are silver crystals that are growing by a chemical reaction caused by a chemical change when the silver nitrate reacts with the copper. When you introduce genetics at the intermediate level, it's important that your students first have a basic understanding of reproduction. And there's two different types. 
The first type is called asexual reproduction, and it's a very simple form. This is reproduction as we saw in the amoeba, where the chromosomes duplicate themselves, then the nucleus splits into two, and then finally the cell splits into two. In this case, because the chromosomes duplicated themselves, we have the exact same genes in the new cells. So all the traits, similar traits, are transferred to the daughter cells. These new cells can be called clones. Although there are different types of asexual reproduction, they're mostly limited to lower life forms. The other type of reproduction, sexual reproduction, is found in plants and animals. And in sexual reproduction, we have a much more complex phenomenon. In this case, we have special cells called sex cells, and they're made by the sex organs. And compared to other cells, these cells are special in the fact that they only have half the number of required chromosomes. For example, a human being has 46 chromosomes, but in a sex cell, there's only 23. And when a male sex cell and a female sex cell come together, we get the required 46. It's much like a zipper with the male and the female halves of the chromosome string coming together. And when they do, they zip right up together. This also explains why different species cannot mate because the two zippers don't fit. Now the chromosomes also carry the genetic material, the biological blueprint of the cell. And because the new offspring in this case, in sexual reproduction, is a combination of the biological blueprint of the female and the biological blueprint of the male, then the offspring is going to have certain traits representing each one. Now, if some of these traits are hidden in either parent as a recessive gene, then it's quite possible that that trait could become apparent in the offspring. And this is what we're going to look at next, some activities to investigate dominant and recessive genes. As we continue to investigate genetics, it's important to reinforce the fact that each trait is represented by a pair of genes, one from the male and one from the female. For the first activity, we'll investigate certain human traits. To do this, divide your class up into small groups of two to four per group. And with a handout sheet, have them make observations of other people in their groups and record the results. The first observation we'll look for is attached or unattached earlobes. Secondly, we'll see how many people are tongue rollers. Third, we'll look for hitchhiker's thumb. Hitchhiker's thumb is when you can bend your thumb back more than 45 degrees, perhaps to a 90 degree angle. And this, of course, is a 45 degree angle. And the fourth trait we'll look for are PTC tasters. That's a special kind of chemical, and you can buy this paper at a science supply house. It's very inexpensive, about a dollar or two for over a hundred sheets. Now, when you put PTC paper in your mouth, if you're a taster, it tastes very bitter, almost like quinine. I don't happen to be a taster, and I can chew this stuff all day, and it just tastes like a piece of paper. So we'll record the results for that. After we do these series of experiments, we'll take all the class data and put it on the blackboard. And we'll see how many tasters we have in the classroom, how many people with attached, how many people with unattached earlobes, how many tongue rollers, and how many people have hitchhiker's thumb. Then to continue with this activity, send your students home with an additional worksheet and have them do the same tests on their immediate family members mothers, fathers, grandfathers, uncles, any blood relatives, including brothers and sisters, and then come in the next day with the results. If you have sufficient PTC paper to hand out, have ask them how many people are in their family and have them test each family member with the PTC paper and then record the results. We now should have some data on the following day to take a look at how these genetic codes transfer by heredity. Let's assume that a trait like tasting PTC paper is caused by only one pair of genes. And within that pair, there may be one gene that's stronger or more dominant than the other. 
we'll represent that gene with a capital letter. In this case, we'll choose a capital T. The other gene, recessive gene, we will represent with a small t. In this case, the small t represents the non-taster. So each and every one of you out there can be represented by one of these four combinations. Since the capital T is always dominant over the small t, anyone with the first three combinations will be able to taste PTC paper. And those who have two recessive genes, represented by two lowercase letters, will be non-tasters. If the genes are both dominant or recessive, the person has a pure trait. If they are a combination of dominant and recessive, the person has a hybrid or mixed trait. In this case, the dominant gene prevails, but the person still carries genes for the recessive trait within each cell. Let's use a block diagram to see the different combinations that are possible from particular male and female parents. In this diagram, the mother's genes for PTC will be on the left, and the father's genes will be on the top. Let's first cross a pure female non-taster with a pure male taster. We write the correct combination in the proper boxes. Notice that the capital letter always goes first. We see that all possible combinations, hence all children, will be hybrid tasters. Remember that since the capital T, or taster, is dominant, it will always overpower the small t. Now let's see what we get when we cross two hybrid parents. Here we see the possibility for both tasters and non-tasters. Notice that there is a 3 in 4 chance of the offspring being a taster. In the next example, we will cross two non-tasters. Can you see the combinations that are possible? Since both are pure, we only generate pure offspring, and in this case, all non-tasters. We have the opposite results when two pure tasters come together. This could be a good springboard for a discussion on breeding dogs, horses, or roses. It's important that your students understand that recessive does not mean inferior. It merely means that when mixed with a dominant gene, the traits are not apparent. For example, being able to roll your tongue is dominant. It doesn't mean you're any better by being able to do it. It merely means that you have at least one dominant gene, tongue rolling gene, in your biological blueprint. Did you know that being nearsighted is dominant over the recessive normal vision? If you are nearsighted and your husband or wife is also nearsighted, there is at least a 3 in 4 chance that your children will be nearsighted too. In the worst case, if you are both pure dominant, then there is a 100% probability. Let's investigate how this chance happens with a fun game called the Square of Fortune. First split your class up into a number of groups of three each. Give each group a card like this. Here we're crossing two hybrids together. Each student in the group will have a specific task. The first student's job is to move her finger around from one box to the next in a uniform, orderly fashion. Student number two should not be able to see what student number one is doing. Anytime he wishes, he can say stop. When he says stop, whichever box the first student's in, she must stop there. And the third student records the two letters that are found in that particular box. Each group does this individual activity 20 times, gathers 20 pieces of information, and then looks at the scores and groups them. How many times did the two capital T's show up? And so on. After they count up the total number, you take the whole class and look at all of their data together. Solicit answers from group 6 and see what their numbers were in group 5 and so on, and put all these numbers on the board. Which ones turned up the most? Well, according to probability, it would appear that you would get a capital T and a small t much more frequently than you get these other two. 
In fact, out of 200 times, you should get about 100 of these, capital T, small t's, and of only about 50 of these two. This starts to suggest how different offspring, how there's different probabilities that particular children will have specific traits. Now let's go on and take a look at this next card. This next card has two dominant traits from the father and a hybrid trait from the mother. This time before we start the activity, let's solicit from the students what they think the results will be. Well, looking at this card, we see it looks pretty even. Out of 200 data pieces, we would expect 100 to be pure dominant and the other 100 to be hybrid. You can continue with this by discussing reasons why we don't get these exact results when performing this experiment. Skin color and eye color are also inherited traits. A chemical pigment called melanin is responsible for this color. A pair of genes directs the making of melanin in the cell, and other pairs of genes determine the quantity of the melanin to be made in the particular individual. This is why some people have fair skin and other people have darker skin. In fact, there's many variations of different skin colors depending on the quantity of melanin that's produced. There's also a close association between melanin and the color of eyes. People with blue eyes have no melanin at all, and that's why you see the relationship of fair-skinned, blue-eyed people and people with brown eyes have darker skin because they have a lot of melanin pigment in their eyes. Let's continue to investigate eyes and take a hypothetical student whose parents both have brown eyes, but she has blue eyes. And let's see how we can explain this. We will start by assuming that brown eyes are dominant over blue eyes. See if a student in your class can use this information and explain how these two brown-eyed parents can make a blue-eyed child. The answer, of course, is that the parents are both hybrids with one dominant and recessive gene each, and the child is that one in four probability of a double recessive blue-eyed trait. There are some important concepts from all of this. First, that traits can be unnoticed and unapparently carried and passed on from generation to generation. When two hybrids unite, they may produce an offspring with the two recessive genes and a new trait, like blue eyes from two brown-eyed parents. Another important concept is to realize that all people are different in many ways. These variations are caused by differences in the genetic blueprint. Let's pursue this idea of variations a bit further with some simple experiments. Have you ever wondered how the size of your hand compares to that of everyone else? Well, that's what we'll do in this experiment. And besides investigating variations, we'll also be developing skills in mathematics and measuring. What we'll do is divide your class up into small groups again, give each group a ruler and a handout sheet, and have them measure their hand span, how far it is from the thumb to the little finger, in millimeters. Once they've recorded the data, you need to transfer each group's data to the other group. You can either have them all write down the values, or you can put all the data on the board. Once they have this data, they can start working with it. The first thing they might look at is what is the high value, who has the largest hand, and who has the smallest hand, and perhaps what is the average hand span in the class. Another thing to do is to divide it up into different brackets, say five millimeter brackets, and see how many students fit into each particular bracket. And then you can go on and make a histogram, and you may see something like this. On the vertical column, I have the number of students. And on the horizontal column, you can see that I have all of my different brackets. And it goes from less than 140 all the way up to more than 210. And these are five millimeters each. By doing this experiment, your students will realize that there are many different variations, even among their own class members. Now let's investigate lima beans. The question we want to answer here is, are lima beans all the same weight? How much variation is there from one lima bean seed to the next? 
This time, of course, we'll be using our balance, a very valuable piece of equipment. And I talked about the operation of this in the K3 physical science tape. Break your class up into groups again and give them a small number of lima beans, about 20 per group. Have each group weigh each bean and record the weights. When I did it, I actually tested about 48 lima beans here and found the high and heaviest lima bean was this one right here and it weighed about 1.7 grams. And my lightest one was this little one right here. It only weighed 7 tenths of a gram. It's important once again to stress very accurate measuring here because we're talking about tenths of a gram. Most of my lima beans appear to weigh about 1.2 grams. I went and recorded the data. In fact, you will take all of the class data and put it together and have the students make another graph. When I made my graph, I used a line graph this time, and you can see how the lima beans were distributed throughout the sample that I used. If you don't have balances available, you can always do this same experiment and measure the length of the lima beans. I tried that on kidney beans. I tested 50 different kidney beans and found out that they didn't vary that much. In fact, only by about 4 millimeters. So once again, it's important to stress very accurate measurements. You can go on and study plants, too. Take a branch off of a bush somewhere and test the length of different leaves. You want to measure the length of the leaf and perhaps even the length of the stem from here to here. See how much variation there is amongst leaves on a plant. By doing a series of experiments, students will better understand that variations do exist among living things, even within a group of the same species.